Welcome to The Rot Focus, a podcast for rotters, newbies, and veterans, and everyone in between. We're hosted by M.A. Lee with the assistance of Remy Black and Edie Rooms, all from Rotters, Inc. Books. Our focus is productivity, process, craft, and tools. Each episode lasts as long as it takes to fix a quick dinner, drive a short commute, or take a brisk walk. Resources and links are in the show notes. Visit us at therightfocus.blogspot.com. Now, on to this week's episode. Every plot has a beginning, middle, end. Tension and suspense drive each of these sections. Plotting prose, poetry, the choice doesn't matter in narrative. Telling a story is the focus, and all stories are formed through a series of scenes and sequels which bridge between the scenes. Two things control the main plot and each subplot. These are the heart and the brain that will drive every scene and its sequel. The heart is the theme, which is the key to unlock the brain, our conflict that controls the plot. These are the plotting essentials, theme, conflict, scene, sequel. What is a theme? The main idea that controls a story? Doesn't it sound simple? No, not when we hear people say the theme is war, or control, or chaos, or how Henry V came into an understanding of his kingly role. None of these our theme. The theme is the heart, and it's a beating heart, with blood pumping through to power every organ and muscle. Themes are complete sentences, not single words or phrases. A single word or phrase is a subject. While themes may deal with ideas in opposition, the simple statement of those ideas does not express a theme. Themes are universal, not specific to a single work. While the theme may illuminate the ideas in that work, the universal theme may be applied to many different works as well. Any internet search of themes will bring up a list of common subjects of literature that are called themes. Misapplication of a literary term is common. The popular definition of comedy is a funny story. The classical definition of comedy is a narrative in which the protagonist achieves the goal. As writers, we distinguish among topic, subject, and theme. Topic is a simple expression of idea, such as, I want to write about the merry men of Robin Hood's band. Subject, the basic words or phrase of that topic, outlaws. Theme, a focused subject presenting a consequence. Reformed outlaws have difficulty Returning to Society, which is the theme of Robin McKinley's Outlaws of Sherwood. Topic, lust is often confused with love. Subject, lust versus love. Theme, while lust is temporary, love is enduring. Or we can say lust objectifies a person based on appearance. Love celebrates a person's essential self which is the theme of Jane Austen's Emma. Topic. It's hard to find the perfect gift. Subject. Gift giving. Theme. The perfect gift is not an object, but the self, which is the theme of O. Henry's Gift of the Magi. It helps if you know the source for your theme. Slow and steady wins the race, which you can switch around to make the thematic sentence flow. In the fable, the tortoise and the hare, the tortoise is slow and steady, they have the race between them, and the tortoise wins. That's the subject, the focus, and the consequence. Sometimes it's helpful to think of those things. These three things will create a theme. The subject, its focus or direction, and its consequence. The theme source, Henry V by William Shakespeare. Subject, great people, black kings. Focus, discovery of purpose. Consequence, that discovery only occurs through obstacles and trials. 
theme, great people like kings and other leaders through obstacles and trials discover their true purpose. Another theme source, a proverb. The subject, the love of money. The focus, evil. The consequence, causation. Theme, the love of money is the root of evil. Theme source, The Scarlet Ibis by James Hurst. Our subject, two brothers and the conflict between them. That's the focus, they're at odds. And the consequence is family destruction. Theme, the war between two brothers will cause the destruction of a family. Theme source, Mansfield Park by Jane Austen. Our subject, attraction versus love. Our focus, observing behavior during challenging circumstances. Our consequence, enduring love. The theme, the difference between temporary attraction and enduring love is only discovered through the observation of people's behavior during challenging circumstances. Our theme source, Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. Our subject, intense passion. Our focus, that is a powerful force. And the consequence, it disrupts and destroys lives. Intense passion is a powerful force that can disrupt and destroy lives. Conflict. Working in opposition, creating obstacles, destroying easy paths to the goal. All of these are simple examples of conflict. Whatever stands between the primary character and the desired goal is the conflict. The conflict is the brain directing every choice of word and action, every use of sensory images and metaphor, every trait and reaction that we writers pour onto the page. The desired goal needs to be achievable even as it is difficult to achieve. Desired means the goal will be life-changing. Some flaw or lack in a person's life can be fixed, filled, fulfilled, or improved through perceived attainment of the goal. Perceived is a key word in that sentence. The original goal does not have to achieve the desired outcome. The original desired goal can morph or moderate, be transferred to another goal, or even erased completely. Dissatisfaction with the original goal becomes a conflict during the middle section of a book with pursuit of the new desire forming the rest of the middle and through to the end. The desired goal can be misunderstood by the protagonist and the antagonist. A way to add additional conflict and angst to a plot is to have the protagonist achieve the desired goal early in the story, only to discover the goal's achievement does not meet the desire or that the desire was misidentified. In literary fiction, the irony of not achieving that desired outcome is crucial. In genre fiction, order usually triumphs over chaos, whether that order is lovers cementing a relationship, an evil mastermind's defeat, the underdog learning to control wild magic or tech or science, or the like. Whether or not readers consciously express that they want order to triumph over chaos, our subconscious expectation of order's defeat of chaos is ingrained by the millennia of storytelling. Yet a door to chaos can be cracked open in the last of the story. After the primary conflict is resolved, and order is seemingly restored. For example, in The Silence of the Lambs, the serial killer is caught, the last intended victim is rescued, and the protagonist returns to the FBI training center. Then she receives a call from the escaped Hannibal Lecter, informing her that he hopes to meet her again. Anne Rice's interview with the vampire resolves Louis' conflict, perhaps not in the reader's anticipated way. He rejects the reporter's offer, just as he rejects the half-life of vampirism, although he still cannot face death. Then, when all seems resolved, Lestat re-enters, taking what Louis had refused, cracking open the door for the vampirical evil that Louis rejected. This sliver of chaotic darkness creates surprise for the reader, all seems resolved, but is not. 
Chaos holds the key, not order. Six types of conflict are taught in every elementary and middle grade school as if the list is the only thing to say about plot. Person versus the self, such as Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, Hannah Green's semi-autobiographical I Never Promised You a Rose Garden, Person versus Person, any Agatha Christie with Hercule Poirot or Miss Marple, Suzanne Collins's The Hunger Games, Person versus Society, Government or Institution or Group, Suzanne Collins's Catching Fire, Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird, Person versus Machine, such as Technology, The Terminator, or Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, Person versus Nature, John Krakauer's Into Thin Air, Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God, Person versus Fate, The Supernatural, The Gods. Bernard Evelyn's Ulysses makes the conflict against the Greek gods very clear. Christopher Marlowe's Dr. Faustus, or Gertie's version, sometimes fate and supernatural are separated. All types of conflict have a protagonist and an antagonist. At the center of these words is the Greek root agon, which means conflict. The protagonist faces the conflict. The antagonist is the conflict creator. I've written about the seven types of plot in great detail in my book, Think Like a Pro, when I detailed the seven lessons every writer needs. In the chapter on plot, I defined, described, and detailed several examples of each type. I will merely list the seven types here with a range of examples. Plot type, overcoming the monster. Pride and Prejudice. Lord of the Flies. Jaws. A Rag to Riches plot. Oliver Twist. Great Gatsby. Pretty Woman. The Quest. Northanger Abbey. Watership Down. Raising Arizona. A Comedy plot. Much Ado About Nothing. Blues Brothers. Airplane. A tragedy plot, Macbeth, Philadelphia, Rebel Without a Cause. Rebirth plot, Christmas Carol, Now Voyager, Avatar. Voyage and Return plot, Odyssey, Brideshead Revisited, and Mansfield Park. Scene and sequel. These two terms come from Dwight Swain's Techniques of the Selling Writer, a decades-old writing book that still has great value for those who wish to study storytelling. My discussion of scenes and sequels expounds on Swain's terms based on my practical application melded with other terms such as characterization, theme, mood, and more. A scene is an encapsulated event that fulfills one of the steps for one plot progression, thematic understanding, revelation of character, or for relationship development. For example, scenes that contain one of the six elements of characterization reveal personality, the essential self, or the dynamic change occurring within a character. Those six elements of characterization are actions of the character, reactions of other characters, speech, thoughts and feelings, and appearance, those are the five indirect, and one direct element, which is author statement. Here's a very rough example of revelation of character using A Man Called Horse by Dorothy Johnson. In this short story, set in the American West before 1860, Johnson shows her protagonist dynamic change as he is confronted with a completely new environment and basic survival circumstances that gradually mature him. The character who decides to call himself Horse enters the Native American tribe as a slave after having everything that wealth could provide in his Boston home. In an attempt to win a bit of favor, he presents flowers to the old woman who owns him. This would have been acceptable in Boston. It's not acceptable in the Plains. His action reveals that he has not begun any adaptation to his new environment. The old woman laughs at the presentation of flowers. Her reaction shows that Horace has not yet learned how to honor the elderly women in the tribe. When he sees the old woman kill a dog that offended her one time too many, his thoughts are, that could have been me if I were a dog, but I'm a horse. 
He is beginning the steps toward humility. His pride is being broken, so necessary to rebuild himself in a better mold. Yet he still thinks himself better than the Native Americans. They accept him as different, lesser in rank, lesser in experience, but they are willing to adapt to his new situation when he earns the right to enter the tribe. Horse, however, still considers himself above them. As a part of the tribe's celebration, he dances around the fire, shouting in English, heathens, savages. His speech reveals his pride and his unwillingness to learn more than he has to about the people who are accepting him. Later in the story, the young woman who became his wife dies while having his child. The baby also dies. The old woman cannot offer another physical scarring as visible proof of her grief. Horse does so. Begrudgingly, he slashes his arms as proof of his grief, and he thinks that he must hide his, this change to his appearance when he returns to Boston. The story concludes with Horse willing to sacrifice years of his life to care for the old woman. He thinks to himself that she is old and will not live long, but he is willing to remain and care for her and ensure that her death is natural, not one of starvation or neglect or abuse. At this point, he reduces his own wants and needs for the old woman. His self and his pride are no longer paramount. In Johnson's direct statement, last in the story, he finally knows himself as the equal to any man on earth. Plots are composed of this series of scenes and sequels, the constantly spiraling conflicts of each scene, and the reactions to the actions of those scenes during the sequels. Scenes are often action-filled. Sequels bridge from scene to scene. A law in action occurs. This offers the prospective characters the needed time for contemplation of the events, of their place in these events, and of their anticipation of what will happen next. Plotting with scenes and sequels keeps the story moving for the reader. The various scenes and sequels become enriched by the use of mood, which engages the readers who care about the characters in these scenes and sequels. The mood or emotion of each scene can be set to reinforce theme, character motifs, angst, irony, betrayal, or an unexpected surprise, a twist. Mood, tone, and atmosphere sets the descriptive elements of each scene and sequel. Mood is also related to reader expectations and what the writer needs to develop in each scene to keep the reader engaged in the story. Tony K. Bambera's Blues Ain't No Mockingbird has a primary theme, one of several, that false images must be shattered. From the opening scene to the ending, she uses types of images to reveal this theme. The story begins with children jumping up and down on a frozen puddle until it cracks apart, a frozen image shattered. Twice in the story's middle, Bambera shows two other types of false images, First, a mention of a woman who had intruded on the family's home and wiped her gloved finger over the surfaces, obviously looking for dirt, but unable to find any. This false belief was broken. The second false image was people taking a photograph of a man standing on a bridge, freezing an image of his grief and fear rather than an image that represented him. One horrible moment was not him. The story ends with the grandfather cracking open a camera belonging to reporters with a local news station who had shot film of the family without permission. The reporters had mistakenly picked the family to fit their news story. By opening the camera, the grandfather ruined the film and therefore shattered the false images taken by the news reporters. Blocking scenes and sequels creates a strong progression, an outline, for the writer to follow. If overplotting doesn't kill interest and curiosity for your creative muse. To keep from damaging that creative flow, don't block too many scenes in advance. Know the purpose of each encapsulated event as well as the mood. And you can consult Dwight Swain's guidebook for his specific information about scenes and sequels. The link is in the show notes.
What do writers want to know about plot? What do writers need to know about plot? The right focus is taking a comprehensive view of plot, the structure that develops characters, genre expectations, major story structures, pacing, tension, suspense. We cover it all in this series entitled Discovering Your Plot from M.A. Lee's Guidebook of the Same Name. Writers will discover unexpected insights and methods that deepen their understanding of this major craft in the storytelling world. Thanks for listening to The Right Focus, a podcast for writers at all levels, hosted by M.A. Lee from Writers Inc. Books, assisted by Renee Black and Edie Runes. Our focus is productivity, process, craft, and tools. Music is licensed through Audio Jungle called Background Music Loop. Its creator is Alexander Polishchuk, known on Audio Jungle as Plastic 3. The music comes in different iterations. Show notes and resource links for this and other episodes can be found at therightfocus.blogspot.com. Write to us at linkbooks at aol.com when you have questions, comments, and speculations. We will try to answer you as quickly as possible. By the way, we will not mind your email address. That's rude. If you find value in our content, share with your writing friends or write a review. We're small beans here without the advertising budget of the big peeps, and you can make a difference. And whatever occurs, right on.